Welcome everyone to Learn at Lunch Time. So glad you guys could all join us today. A uh, couple of things. I'm Sherry Trimble, museum educator here at the State Museum, and I'm going to be your tech person. If you have any questions, I'm going to turn it over to my fellow museum educator, Beth Erickson, and we're going to turn it to you, Beth. Thank you, Sherry. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am Beth Erickson, museum educator at the State Museum of Pennsylvania, and this is Adventures in Nature Lab. Our topic today is native plants. And with me is Andrew Rohrbaugh, an ecologist who works for the Bureau of Forestry at the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, where he helps, pr helps protect native wild plants and manages the invasive species that threaten them. In his spare time, he enjoys gardening, hiking, hunting, and raising his two sons to enjoy the great outdoors. Hello, Andrew, thank you for joining us today. Hello, how are you doing? Great. So would you start by telling us a little bit about what you do at the Bureau of Forestry? Yes, uh, my job is to help manage our 2.2 million acres of state forest land across the state. Um, and specifically, my job is to look after our rare native wild plants, um, as well as help deal with the problems with invasive plants. So. Let me start with a basic question about plants. What makes a plant a native wild plant? I will get into that a little bit later, but to give you a heads up, a native wild plant is a plant species that has um, evolved in an ecosystem and naturally occurs there, um, as opposed to a non-native species, uh, which maybe came in or was brought in artificially from, say, Europe, or some other ecosystem that has not naturally evolved uh, to find a niche in. Um, and of course, invasive plants are the ones where have come in from some other place. They have not evolved in this ecosystem, but not only do they survive here, but they do a little too well. That's very interesting. So I think you prepared something for us to give us a background on um, plants in Pennsylvania and natives versus non-natives and invasives. Correct. Uh, okay. Can I start sharing my screen here? Okay. Okay. Right. I know I'm a big gardener. I never really quite know what I'm doing. Um, and unfortunately, I have relied in my life on what they have at the native garden or at the garden center. Um, and recently I've become very aware of looking for the little sign that says native. Um, in order to help contribute. And I think you're gonna tell us some, some of the reasons why. Right, so um, hopefully this will help everyone to understand uh, our native wildflowers and other plants and um, appreciate them. And then learn a little bit more about um, how they could be used in your garden or native landscaping. So, um, so anyways, as you said, my name is Andrew Rohrbach. Um, I work for the Bureau of Forestry as you mentioned, and um, we are the agency in charge of our 2.2 million acres of state forest land. Uh, many of you have probably been on state forest land or you've been on our sister agency, Bureau of State Parks, and some of our state parks. Um, and the Bureau of Forestry's mission is not only to maintain those state forest lands, but also to take care of our forests statewide and to conserve our native wild plants, like this uh, beautiful yellow fringed orchid here. And so we actually have uh, over 3,000 plant species in Pennsylvania. Um, when you're looking at the flowering plant species, uh, almost 2,000 native species, and almost about another third of those, another 1,000 uh, non-native uh, species exist in Pennsylvania. We also have conifers like pine trees, um, about 25 species, and about 100 species of fern. Um, and as I mentioned, I kind of went over that before, but native plant species, the, those that occur naturally in an area, They've evolved there. Um, naturalized plant species are ones that are not naturally occurring to an area. Typically, we think of them as being brought in uh, from another region, another part of the world, um, and they survive here, they reproduce. Um, and then some of those species go on to become invasive and they actually are not native and they can become very aggressive and quickly spread. And to be invasive, there has to be some kind of harm associated with them that might be to human health, that might be to economic uh, issues, or that might be environmental issues. Um, 
And when you look at, we have almost 3,000 plant species in Pennsylvania, um, about 500 right now are ranked as ones that we are concerned about um, in Pennsylvania. So we have quite a bit of, of different plant species that are threatened here in the state um, in one way or another. And oftentimes invasive plant species are an issue with that. So I always like to start off and tell people why they should care about native plant species. So just from an economic standpoint, plants evolved to survive and they've evolved just a number of really amazing traits. Um, and if we lose those plant species, we lose those traits that might be economically valuable to us. So some plant species have evolved chemicals to prevent uh, critters from eating them. And those chemicals can actually be useful um, maybe for medicine um, or for other things. Uh, if you think about rubber, that's a, that's a chemical that plants evolved and now we found ways to make use of it. Um, similarly, this looks like a patch of just white clover that you'd find in your yard, but it's actually Kate's Mountain Clover, a rare uh, Appalachian mountain endemic species that lives in dry, hot, rocky shale barrens. And you can imagine, we're not there yet, but you can imagine that one day it would be quite useful to have um, a clover species with a thick taproot that can survive hot, dry, rocky conditions, still add nitrogen to the soil for our farmers to use. So rather than try to breed a white clover to do all that from scratch, let's try to protect plant species that already have some of those traits that might be useful sometime in the future. So that's just the economic view of it. More importantly, probably, as everyone knows, plants are the base of our food web. Um, almost all of the energy here on the planet that we use is coming from photosynthesis. So if you lose plants, you're losing the base of that food web and all the other critters um, that you enjoy seeing in our ecosystem. Of course, some of those critters are things that we enjoy seeing, like monarch butterflies, you know, and it's, you need native wild plants if you want monarch butterflies or many of our other butterfly species and um, moth species that people enjoy seeing. So if you have milkweed, you might get monarchs. Um, I know this is a fuzzy picture, but it's one that landed on me one day and I snapped a picture and it was a meaningful experience to me. And I, I don't think anyone wants to live in a world where we don't have monarch butterflies. But if you have no milkweed or even worse, if you have that invasive swallowwort species you see in the bottom right, the swallowwort actually takes over habitat from our native milkweed. And it's actually chemically similar enough that sometimes it can trick monarch butterflies into laying eggs on it, and the caterpillars can't survive on that swallowwort. So that's a problem if we don't have our native milkweed or if we have invasive swallowwort. Question about the milkweed. So does the milkweed, it provide, it's a host plant to lay the eggs on, yep. and the caterpillars then can eat it. Does it yep. do anything for adult butterflies besides the where to lay eggs? The adult butterflies will use it for, for nectar and, and pollen. I think just nectar. Okay. Not an entomologist. <laughs> <laughs> That's not okay. <laughs> not putting you on the spot there. Not putting That's you on okay. the spot. <laughs> I'm making to, plans while you're talking. I'm, I'm yep, playing. Oh. Jump in whenever. Um, okay. <laughs> and I don't I don't go into this too much, but if you if you have time, anyone is listening, look up Doug Tallamy. He does work on bringing nature home, and he's really highlighted that you know, a lot of our native plant species are the host for a lot of our native insects. And you might not think that sounds wonderful, even if you like monarch butterflies, but those caterpillars, those insects are crucially important to feeding almost all of our bird species. So if you put out bird food in the winter and you like to see chickadees, if we don't have native plants in the landscape, then we're not going to have the caterpillars and the insects that those chickadees need to rear their young. So almost all of our bird species having native plants is crucially important in their life cycle. And I always like to tell people this, I've told you some of the things that are great about native plants. I'm gonna keep telling you some things that are great about native plants in your landscaping, but it all comes down to a lot of folks, you need, we all need to do our part. So the Lorax said it right. So what can you do at home? Well. A lot of people have landscaping that they appreciate and enjoy. It looks something like this. It's more modern, a lot of non-native species, carefully trimmed to meet their little spot in people's landscaping. And I would challenge people to look at something a little bit more like this. A bunch of native plant species bunched together, um, beautiful, 
And when you look at something like this, what you're looking at isn't just something that's visually attractive, but something that is uh, flowers and host plants for native pollinators, birds, um, butterflies, their seed for birds in the winter, their shelter and overwintering sites in these plants uh, for birds and pollinators and toads. Um, so, I mean, you're looking at something that serves not just the visually um, pleasing look of landscaping, but a lot of ecosystem services. And, you know, in shifting over to this, you have to realize deer might always be an issue. Um, I would recommend when you're shifting to native plants in your landscaping that you know the scientific name of the plants you're planting. And that sounds really challenging to a lot of people. I'm aware of that. But nowadays, with everyone having a cell phone, it's, it's generally pretty easy to quickly look up a species, make sure it's the native variety, the native species, um, and learn a little bit about it. Um, because you want to be matching that native species with the right habitat. Is it prefer sunny or dry or shady or moist? Um, you know, how tall does it get? Uh, because really tall plants can flop over if they're not in the right spot. Um, does it spread by rhizomes? That might be something you really want in some places, but it might not. Um, so those are some things to think about when making that shift to native landscaping. Can you take a minute and kind of, I know what a rhizome is, but just in yep. case our, our that's a, listeners that's do a not. Good, that's a good point. Rhizomes are plants that spread through roots. So they, they don't grow in one nice little clump and stay put, but they start to spread out and pop up other places. Thank you. Yep. And no place is too small. Uh, this is right outside of our building in Harrisburg, the Rachel Carson State Office building, and it's a little tiny planter that we changed over to native wildflowers and other plants. Um, and this place is buzzing with pollinators in the middle of the summer. And so, you know, even, even milkweed, which some people consider a literal weed, it's not something they want in their landscaping. You know, I can tell you this, my parents had it come in in their landscaping as a weed. Um, and it has provided more joy for our family as we've watched monarch butterflies grow and go into chrysalises and emerge and take their first flight, as you see here, uh, and land on some of us. They were constantly <laughs> trying to fly. You know, far more, land, far more joy out of that patch of what a lot of people would consider weeds as a native plant than all the rest of their landscaping combined. And of course, it's not just monarchs. You know, we have things like this. This is a hummingbird clearwing moth. Um, if you've never seen one of these, they're amazing. They look like little hummingbirds. Um, and to feed these and to get these in your landscape, you need not just something like this bee balm, this Minarda, to feed the adults, but you need its host species, which are either a snowberry or a native honeysuckle. So years ago, I never saw these at my house. I planted native honeysuckle, and I started seeing in the last couple of years, finally, these, these clear wing hummingbird moths. Um, but not only that, I started seeing hummingbirds going after these uh, honeysuckle flowers all summer long. But not only that, they'd get aphid infestations. And I think, oh, that's, I don't like those aphids on there. I should knock those off. Every fall and spring, when the birds are migrating through, I get warblers and other bird species that I would never see otherwise hanging up outside my window eating those aphids. It's a food source. So instead of just something to sit on my landscape and maybe look pretty part of the year, it looks pretty and it's feeding all these different insects. So it's kind of thinking long term. It's not just I have something now there's a pest on it that I don't want but that pest is actually going to provide a food source so it's kind of in that chain. So we have to be a little more tolerant exactly. of what's going on in our garden. Exactly. I mean, I, I'll be honest, even, even in my position a couple of years ago, I was thinking I should really take care of those aphids. They may be a little unsightly at different times of year when they start to get a little out of control. I've watched a number of bird species. I mean, just two days ago, I was sitting here watching um, a white-throated sparrow, which I've never seen on my property before. It was migrating through. It hung out in that bush for at least two days, eating those aphids to fuel its migration. So we're keeping the natural cycle by by allowing these things, these different insects to take over a plant, even though we don't like the way it looks. Exactly, and and it's they're not unsightly. For for a couple of weeks of the year, they might look a little meh on some of the blooms, um, but like I said, it doesn't cause any long lasting damage. Um, you can also think of native 
native plants like uh, raspberries and blackberries. And in some areas we let grow a little more wild in my yard. It's hard to see there, but we actually have, let's see if I can show this real quick. We have some blackberries and raspberries growing. And if you look down there, there are my sons foraging <laughs> themselves at the right time of year. So other ecosystem services to feed critters that you might not think about on your landscape. And finally, my one pitch, if you're a gardener, I started off in this house 10 years ago and we had almost no, no flowers around. It was all mowed lawn and woods. And um, we tried to grow tomato plants, got just totally destroyed by tomato hornworm, uh, these caterpillars. Um, I planted a bunch of different wildflowers all throughout my yard. And those brought in, particularly the very small flowers, they brought in parasitic wasps, which I know everyone thinks wasps, so I don't want those, those will sting me. These are so tiny, you wouldn't even notice them. But what those wasps do is they sip on the nectar and those tiny wildflowers, and then they go and they seek out tomato hornworms to parasitize. And over the last six or seven years, I have barely found a single tomato hornworm in my garden that hasn't already been taken care of. So ecosystem so, services, things working together. Are those eggs on the back of the hornworm? Those are the wasp eggs on the back. That's of the crazy. Well, how long will he survive? Not long. <laughs> <laughs> Nature's not always pretty, but like I said, these things work together and, and, and they can work for us. That's great. So just uh, that's my long spiel about why native plants are important, native wildflowers are important. And I'll go through a number of these that, you know, maybe people aren't aware of or things that people could think about using in their property. So we have, I'm going to go through first, of course, everyone's favorite, the milkweed. So butterfly weed is actually one of the milkweed species. The monarchs will use it as a host. Uh, this is one that's a bright orange color. So you don't get that very often with a lot of different flower species. Um, it does prefer sandier, well-drained sites. Um, so oftentimes you'll see this along road banks that are very sandy soil. Um, it wants full sun, and it's not going to grow particularly tall. If you have wetter conditions, maybe a little bit of a retention basin on your property or nearby, um, you could grow swamp milkweed. Um, and it's going to grow a little taller, but look at that just beautiful pinkish purple bloom on that. Once again, host for monarch butterflies. Or if you don't have something that's completely dry or completely wet, you can look at something like our common milkweed. Maybe not quite as showy, um, and it will spread by roots. So you have to be careful where you put it, make sure that it's not going too crazy in your landscaping. Um, but one of the things I love about this one is, and all the milkweeds actually, but this one's got a little bit taller, but those milkweed pods, if you let them stand through the winter, you know, it's just a very interesting visual appeal to have that milkweed pod blowing the seed out during the winter. We have aster species. Um, so right here I have pictured New England aster. Um, I would recommend this is one that you really need to make sure you're looking at the scientific name of it um, because there are all kinds of different aster species and they grow in different conditions. Some grow tall and some grow shorter um, and some grow by rhizome spreading by root. But uh, so putting them in the right place is important in your landscape in your yard. Um, you'll actually notice that this is the New England aster growing here. There's another aster species I have back here that's maybe a little too tall for where I planted it. It's starting to spread on my uh, sidewalk there a little bit much. Um, but this is a great species that late in the summer and early fall, it's going to start blooming and pollinators just be buzzing all over this. Showy goldenrods, another species where it's good to know the scientific name. Um, you can have something like this showy goldenrod that's a little more clumping here, as you can see, or in the background of my, my front yard here, you can see I have a showy uh, or tall goldenrod, which you know can actually spread by rhizomes, be a little aggressive, and get a little tall. So that's one that you know maybe flopping over wherever you put it might be an issue for you. Um, so thinking about that when you go to plant these is important. But once so again, for, great for pollinators. Some, for a plant like that, you want to have maybe some, some medium-sized plants around the taller ones. Correct. Or if you, you put it like I've got it in front of a fence in my garden there, I could tie a string around it to help hold it up later in the year. You know, just, just part of that planning process. One of my favorites 
the mountain mint species, Pycnanthemum. There are several different species once again, um, but this is one that it's in the mint family. So it's gonna spread by roots as you can see it there kind of clustering and spreading um, in this field. Um, but the thing I love about this one is it doesn't get very tall. Um, when I mow my lawn, if I hit a patch of it that's spreading a little in my lawn, there's a beautiful mint smell. I actually pluck a leaf and chew it like a piece of gum for a while. Um, and in July, I have never seen anything like the display of pollinators that are on this, this clump of plants I have. I, I am talking just a, a swarm of bees, wasps, beetles, flies, butterflies. And once again, some people might be a little nervous. Oh, I'm not sure about bees and wasps. They're not looking to sting you. They're just going about their way for food. I mean, I've walked right through this and things are bumping off of me and they don't, you know, they're not worried about me. They're not trying to sting me or anything like that. They're just trying to get a meal. And it is amazing. I've seen species that I don't see any other time of year clumping on, on this species. Um, wonderful. And, and moderately deer resistant for browse. I have that on a few of these. That's a major caveat. Nothing is fully deer resistant. <laughs> What about rabbit resistant? <laughs> Nothing's fully rabbit resistant. Anything. <laughs> hungry rabbit or hungry deer will eat pretty much anything. So. <laughs> Another great one, obedient plant, also in the mint family, uh, grows about three or four feet tall. Um, it, this one will also spread. This can flop over sometimes, but they call it obedient plant because you can actually bend the stem to grow a certain way. So something to think about when you're landscaping. Blazing star. Um, this is one that I've seen covered in butterflies um, in, in the midsummer, mid to late summer. Um, and of course, if you leave these standing flowering stalks till later in the year, the seed is actually great uh, for uh, goldfinches and other birds. Wild bergamot, which unfortunately it was a great disappointment that I found out that wasn't the bergamot that's an Earl Grey tea. Um, but this is one of our Monarda species that is a uh, bee balms are another common name for those. Uh, there are a variety of different species. So once again, look at the species name, make sure you're planting it in the right place. Um, but this is one the butterflies really love. Um, can tend to get mildew if planted in, in uh, wet conditions uh, where it stays a little shaded and wet, uh, but otherwise it's a beautiful flower. Black-eyed Susan. This is actually an annual species, which means the whole plant dies almost every year and it grows back from seed. So this is one that can actually spread around in your landscaping if you leave seed, um, leave places unmulched or something like that. So I like this one because like I said, it just kind of moves around and pops up wherever it can, fills in spaces and obviously a beautiful flower. Definitely does. I've had experience with that where I've, I've had too much of it in an area, thought I removed it and it was still back there. So it definitely, even though it, it's, um, you said it's an annual, right? Yeah, and some so. plants might survive for a year or two, but generally it's a, it's a very short-lived perennial that overwinters. But yeah, that was, that's one that, that keeps coming back. <laughs> prickly pear, we actually have two native care, uh, pear, uh, prickly pear, two native cactus species. Um, so once again, thinking about where you want to put them in your landscape, uh, not where there's around pets or children, although I have them and my children have all learned that lesson once. Um, <laughs> that's all it takes. But uh, wonderful plants for places that are just too rocky and dry for almost anything to help them survive. And a beautiful yellow or yellow orange flower. And they're Pennsylvania native. They are Pennsylvania native. Everyone's that's very amazing. surprised to find out that we have some native cactus species. Coneflower, purple coneflower, it's technically not native to the state, so you can see it's native to Ohio and, and further south, west of here, but it's pretty close to our ecosystem. Um, and there's a lot of different cultivars that, that people plant, different colors. Um, and this is one that typically stays put where you plant it, it's not spreading aggressively via rhizomes. Um, and a very, very tolerant plant. And not only is it beautiful when it's blooming, but once again, if you leave those seed heads up, it's good food for birds. Wild Bleeding Heart, another one that's very important to see the scientific name because there's a lot of other non-native species that people have planted. Um, not that I know of any of them become invasive, but um, still something to think about. 
And this is one that prefers a little bit more shady conditions sometimes, um, more acidic, a little bit tougher conditions, rocky, um, and uh, just a beautiful lacy foliage on this. Um, very low growing plant, beautiful pink flowers. I love seeing this out and about. And another beautiful flower, um, the wild columbine, um, which is one of the earliest flowers to really pop out on the landscape and just you know, I don't, I don't know how you can beat that that flower for visual appeal on your landscaping. So. And of course, before I run out of too much time here, we've got some native vines, virgin's bower, clematis, and other species. It's very important to look at the scientific name and the nativity because we do have some aggressive, invasive, non-native uh, clematis species. Um, and this is one that not only has the white flowers that are pretty, but later in the year, the seed pods have that weird kind of feathered look to them. Are they the ones that, clematis are the ones that climb up? Yes, clematis are vines that'll climb up. Another vine that'll climb up is Virginia creeper, which can be a little aggressive. Um, people mistake this for poison ivy sometimes, but it has five leaves there that you see. Um, berries for the birds and a beautiful red foliage in the fall. And we have some things that you might not be aware of, coral berry. There's a native and a non-native species, but uh, the native one, I uh, recommend beautiful purple berries that hang around until later in the year when the birds might eat them, or deer. I know my sister was saying the deer actually ate all her berries as a snack. Um, and this is one that you have to think about and learn a little bit about the plant because it can root at the tips of its branches and start to spread that way and form a little bit more of a hedge, which can be a good thing depending on where you Fragrant sumac, another one that kind of looks like poison ivy, but is a uh, um, beautiful red foliage in the fall, a uh, little fruit for the birds, and um, actually does really well in drier, rocky soils. Our eastern redbud, I love seeing these early. One of the one of those first you know flowers really pop along our highways. Um, I have a bunch of these on my property that I planted, and just sitting underneath one of these early in the season and watching all the, the bumblebees fly around its branches, it's really, really amazing. If you're looking for something a little bigger, maybe to screen between you and your neighbors, uh, you can plant American holly, uh, which has berries um, for later in the year for birds. You plant the male and female for, um, trees. And uh, of course, so the birds will eat that and you've got that evergreen uh, screening. If you're not worried about the evergreen, uh, the evergreen screening all year, you can plant another ilex species, uh, winterberry which still has those persistent berries for the birds. And I will, will just run through a couple grasses. Oh, you're fine, keep going, this is interesting. We've got uh, native grasses like big blue stem or turkey foot, which can get very large, up to, up to eight feet tall in the right moist conditions. Um, can be a little aggressive in some situations, but a uh, very nice plant if you're looking for something to screen something. And I would recommend on that one researching varieties because there are a lot of different varieties with different uh, growing conditions and heights. Indian grass, a little bit smaller, but just a, a beautiful plant when it's going to flower and seed. Um, and there's actually varieties that they have for that that are a little bit more glaucous, which means a little bit more bluish gray look to them. Um, and this one can do a little bit better in some drier conditions than, than the uh, big blue stem. For really wet conditions, you've got a shorter growing bushy blue stem. Um, and this is one that I like because it's got in those uh, bushy tufts of seeds that stick around till later in the year. Um, so over the winter, it's a little bit of visual appeal, kind of like the milkweed seed pods. We have river oats, um, which actually will grow a little earlier in the year. It's one of our cool season grasses. And uh, the seed pods on that one, beautiful when they first go to seed, like the um, beautiful vivid green and then when they dry out they're this, this pretty tan um, look on your landscaping filling things in from underneath and then just a couple ferns real quick that you might consider if you've got a, a shadier wetter spot uh, ostrich fern which is going to grow uh, relatively tall um, bumps like that so that can be a nice appeal on your landscaping or christmas fern uh, which is uh, evergreen and uh, a little bit shorter. 
So with that, I'm going to stop talking. Um, hopefully everyone found this interesting. I do wanna say if you Google some of those links down at the bottom there, just Google those keywords. Um, some of those websites should come up and teach you a little bit more. Um, my email address is there if you have any questions or thoughts. Um, and I do wanna just finish off by saying this picture is a pink lady slipper field that's in one of our, uh, one of our state forests. And if you do want to put native plants on your landscaping, make sure you go to a reputable landscaper that's grown these sustainably. Um, don't go out and dig them up out of our land, our native areas. They're already under enough pressure. Um, and unfortunately for things like this pink lady slipper, people that go to poach those don't realize um, they actually have a um, relationship with underground fungus. And once you sever that, this plant won't survive in your landscaping without it. So um, you might not be successful in getting your landscape and you might actually just kill the plant, unfortunately. So thank you very much. That's, this is all great advice, uh, I, especially the part about writing down or putting on your phone the scientific name of the plant, because it can be confusing when you go to your garden center you know, they have a big table of asters and you're kind of, you just pick one because it's pretty, but it may not be the right one for our area. And there's so many, I mean, even when I started trying to learn all plants and everything like this and started off, you know, it was before smartphones really became a thing. And um, so I basically was stuck trying to figure out with just like keys, like this uh, Newcomb's Wildflower Guide, which is still really great. But now you can download all kinds of apps on your phone and try to key things out that way. You can download, you can have the Seek app, I think iNaturalist, which can help identify things by picture and it's getting better and better. Um, and like I said, just Googling things online, a lot of great websites with great information about how to use these plants, where they grow, where they're native to, um, a lot of great resources out there. Well, our listeners so, uh, have some comments and some questions. Yep. Along is, that way, uh, I wanted to say something, Beth. Um, there is a lot of information here, and one of the requests is, can we have a list of these? And I will send those out uh, later in an email. So, and now I will turn it over to Beth. Use that Q and A box <laughs> in the bottom. Yeah. So one of our one of your our listeners uh, really loves the Bringing Home Nature book. So that was a great one. And this is a question that I have as well. Does mulch hurt or help native plants? And I guess you're gonna. My guess is it's gonna depend on what kind of mulch you're using. It depends on the mulch. It depends on how thickly you mulch and it depends on what you want to look for in your native landscaping. Um, most people, I think when they do native landscaping, they really try to clump their plants and cover all the space. Um, and in those situations, I've seen folks say, don't mulch. Um, other people are still looking for something that's a little bit more of the, you know, kind of modern, uh, the norm, normal landscaping look, uh, very ordered plants and clusters, um, and you can still mulch with those. Um, it depends on what, what you want to look for. That's why I do warn people, though, if they're looking for that kind of look, be aware of which one of these spread by roots, because you might wind up having not just one cluster after two or three years, you might be like, oh, wow, this is really, and I will admit that the, uh, the tall goldenrod that I planted, it's, uh, it's gotten pretty aggressive in a couple spots in my uh, landscaping. And I kind of look back on that and think, hmm, if I was looking for something a, a little bit more formal looking, I, this would have been a bad choice. But, but so yeah, you can mulch. Um, it, if you do mulch, it's going to impact something like the black-eyed Susan, the annual species. Um, so I don't think there's necessarily a right way or wrong way to go about it. I'm still Another discussing one. what to do on my own here. <laughs> <laughs> Another question that we have is uh, from somebody who's listening and they live in an apartment with a nice size patio. They're interested in creating a container garden. However, the patio is shaded most of the day. Are there any PA species, native PA species that would do well without full sun? Yeah. Um... I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, I know some of our uh, ephemeral species are oftentimes do okay with a little bit less sunlight. Um, so the bleeding hearts uh, might do well in those conditions. Um, 
I'm not sure off the top of my head which ones I would recommend for that situation for a container garden with no sun, um, but I do know the back of my house is relatively shady most of the day. Um, and I have things like foam flower growing there. Um, you could probably do some of the coral roots, um, some of the different um, like Mehania cordata, I'm blanking on the, the common name for that one. I've got growing back there. Um, things, things that if you think about things that might grow in forest understories, like I said, a lot of those spring ephemeral wildflowers, things like that might might do well in that situation. And then we have a question about uh, aphids. Um, a listener has a, had a swamp milkweed for the first time last year, and it was covered with aphids and milkweed bugs. Are they harmful pests? Will they kill the plant? And she sprayed them with soapy water and she wants to know if that was correct. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's what I've always considered doing with my uh, honeysuckle. It's right on our front porch. It's one of the first things people see when they walk in. That's why I've always kind of gone back and forth about the aphids. If I was gonna do something, it would be spraying them with soapy water. Um, but typically, not in all situations, if you have a weakened plant, that might be the last straw for it. But typically, I mean, these plants have evolved to coexist with those aphids, the milkweed uh, bugs and whatnot. Um, so they might be a little unsightly at different times of the year, but they're not going to kill the plant. Um, different situation, you might have a stress plant, like I said, that might be the last, <laughs> the last straw for it. But in general, you know, uh, we watched that with the milkweed that I said I had at my parents' house. It got hammered by milkweed bugs and aphids. Um, and they've done fine. So another listener, another <laughs> listener had success with milkweed like you did as well. So had lots of monarch butterflies come into the, the garden. So that's great. Um, a question about wild columbine. It's said to be full sun to full shade. How is that possible? <laughs> that's a good question. Can that, it be full that, sun or full shade? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, that is one actually that I've seen mostly where I see that growing is rocky conditions where you know it's particularly moist um, generally. But if you think about it, oftentimes when columbine is growing is early in the season. It's, it's put its leaves out, it's flowering, and so there's not a lot of canopy cover overhead. Um, but I have seen it out in full sun cliffs and I have seen it in forest understories um, I wouldn't say full shade, perhaps, but you know, when it gets its leaves out and starts photosynthesizing before the trees can really get their canopy out, you know, it does pretty well. So it's a little, little weird, but it, it, it's an interesting little plant. A lot of those spring ephemerals that, you know, they start start early. Well, that's this will lead to this question: How do we plant these flowers? Do we start by seed or by stem? Depends on the species. <laughs> uh, that's a very vague question. Um, I, as much as I, I've learned about these plant species, as much as I've used them, I still make a lot of mistakes. Um, I personally have not been always successful at starting from seeds uh, for, for some of these. Um, it's very hit or miss in terms of my success right there. Um, so I can't really make any good recommendations there. I'd, I'd look that up and I'd maybe talk to some of your local horticulturalists. <laughs> well, it, along the same lines, what are some examples of invasive plants to avoid? So for, especially if we're at the garden center, we see something and it's pretty and we think, oh, well, maybe. What do we avoid? There are a lot of those. Um, I would say in terms of going to the garden center and seeing things and buying them, things to avoid. Um, Japanese spirea, burning bush, um, Japanese honeysuckle. Um, those are the big ones, purple loose strife. Uh, those are some of the big ones that pop into my head right away. Um, there's a lot more and we're trying to work at decreasing the um, availability of those invasive plant species. Um, but those are the big ones that pop out to my head. One of our listeners has a problem with an invasive vine. They have Mile a Minute and Virginia Creeper all over their property. What is the best way to get rid of them? Well, I would say leave the Virginia Creeper because I like it. <laughs> and it's native and it's serving, it's serving a purpose. But 
you know, like if it's, if it's in your yard and it's causing you a problem, then sure. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any problem with decreasing the number of native plants if you have a, a reason for that. The key difference there is the mile minute is a very aggressive plant um, and it hasn't evolved in our ecosystem. And it's one of my least favorite invasive plants. Um, I struggle with it on my property, even though I only have about two and a half acres. Um, we do have a biocontrol weevil that's out for the mile minute vine, and that helps a lot. Chances are, depending on wherever that listener is, or that, um, it's already in your area um, and helping. Now, helping is not solving the problem for mile minute. But I would say the key thing for mile minute to consider is it's an annual vine. So every year that vine completely dies back, root system dies everything, and it regrows from seed at the, at the start of the next growing season. So if it were me, I would try to make sure, and it is me because I'm doing this at my house, I would make sure that I'm going out and hand pulling the mile a minute vine midsummer before it can start going to seed um, and making sure that I'm, if it is going to seed that I'm removing that seed and bagging it and throwing it in the trash. Um, or you can use a pre-emergent herbicide, uh, which actually is a chemical you put down in late winter, early spring, typically before St. Patrick's Day around then. And what that does is it forms a chemical layer in the soil um, that does not allow for annual seeds to germinate and develop the roots. Um, so I know people, there's always mixed feelings or thoughts about um, herbicide, but invasive plants are tough to deal with without. We have a couple more questions we're going to try to get to. One is, would you recommend a ground cover for a shady area where grass does not grow? Um, there's a number of different species that could grow under those low light conditions. Um, violets, native violets can grow in those conditions. Um, partridge berry. Um, oftentimes grow in low, low light conditions, particularly if it's a little more acidic, or same thing with winterberry. Um, perhaps something like green and gold, uh, which I'm blanking on the scientific name, chrysogonum or something like that, um, is another option. Uh, also, um, if it gets early season sunlight, you might be able to get um, some. Like ragwort, like a um, Senecio, I'm, I'm blanking on that name too right now off the top of my head, but uh, a beautiful ragwort flowers that, you know, this time of year are actually out and blooming. If they get early season sun, they're typically pretty happy in lower light conditions. So those are some options. Thank you. Are there, are there standards that garden centers have to use to identify plants so that um, one of the listeners was saying they went in and asked for a native plant and were told that lum limber pines were native to Pennsylvania and they're actually to the part, uh, native to the Rocky Mountain area. Nah, yeah, there's no standards that I'm aware of, although to be fair, I don't work for our Department of Ag. Um, so that'd be a better question for them, but I'm not aware of any standards. That's why, like I said, having, having your cell phone, doing a quick Google search, going to give you a lot of information very quickly these days, which is very nice to have. And I know you've prefaced with you're not an entomologist, but, and I was expecting one of these, question about cicadas and planting trees. So um, one of our listeners has been planting trees recently, and they're concerned about protecting the trees from the cicadas. I know we've got our big cicada um, uh, emer uh, group to emerge this year. Um, What's the best way to kind of protect the uh, roots of the tree? Do you keep it bagged or tented? Well, I for one welcome our new cicada overlords for the year. I am very excited. Uh, so, <laughs> I had a feeling you were going to say that. I, I am, I'm tremendously, I, I love, I'm just looking out my window and watching the hummingbirds come, the clearing moths, and then I, I, I love things like this. I love watching them happen. So it's really exciting for me. But if you have a young tree, I have heard that they can be um, susceptible to some of the damage uh, because the female cicada can crawl up and, and she'll lay or deposit her eggs and cause physical damage to the tree. Um, 
the problem is I think the young will drop and then burrow underground and they live on the root systems. I don't know how you would protect a tree from that so much without using a lot of like insecticide or something. I can't offer any um, suggestions on that. Um, I wish I could remember because I did see some recommendations somewhere um, on avoiding damage from the cicada females laying their eggs physical damage on the tree branches, but I can't remember it right now, unfortunately. There's something out there, though. But I, I, I think in general, it's not that much damage. It's a, yeah. it's a short period of damage, so. Yeah, but I, I did see that they said on, on weaker or smaller trees, depending on the level of cicada emergence, it can be an issue sometimes. I'm not too concerned about it here, but you just spent- You, well, you welcome all comers to your garden. I do, and if you just spent eighty dollars on a tree, I could see you might not. You might want to protect that investment. But like I said, there's something out there, and I just it'll. I'll remember it at three o'clock this morning. <laughs> well, that's helps. okay. We actually can't get to all of our questions today because we are about out of time. And Andrew, I'm going to ask if you stop sharing your screen. I'm going to share some information here. And for those of you whose questions we did not get to, we will be. Um, Send, we're going to send those questions to Andrew and we are going to get them answered for you. So you'll receive that along with your link to the uh, finished uh, uh, recording of this program. So, um, and we thank you. We had several comments in there too, Andrew, of people saying, hey, that was awesome. So, thank you, everyone. All right. So, coming up, let's see. Um, well, Andrew, I'll start, I'll finish up by saying thank you for joining us. I personally know I'm going to be making some changes to my gardens. I cringed a couple times when you mentioned a couple plants, mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to make sure to uh, follow your tips and pay more attention. So if you want to explore more about this topic or other topics related to Pennsylvania, visit um, our website. I believe Sherry dropped the links in the chat box for um, the DCNR information. I and did, I did. Excellent. And Andrew's, con and Andrew's contact information. So if you have um, a direct question for him, he is willing to answer that. So I hope everyone will join us in June for a conversation with Betsy Lepo. We're going to talk about Lepidoptera and their important role in the ecosystem. So visit our website at statemuseumpa.org to sign up for the June Adventures in Nature Lab and any of our upcoming programs. Um, there's some terrific ones. Uh, Walks with Walter is one I'm looking forward to myself. So um, consider uh, joining any of these, depending upon what you're interested in. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending today. Thank you again, Andrew, for your great information. And we look forward to hearing from everybody next week. Thank you. <laughs>